The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. <coughs> Well, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before we uh, get started the sermon proper here today, I just want to take a minute to say how lovely are our poinsettias. Yeah. Those are beautiful. So, thank you for all those who helped make that happen. Uh, I understand, Steve. Maybe you had a large part where Steve went with Steve. Uh, there is hiding behind some people. Uh, so thank you for that. Whoever else helped you, we want to thank you guys uh, for doing that. It's just amazing. You know, as we host uh, our stepping back in time tonight, we're going to have many people in the community uh, enter the sanctuary. And uh, how lovely it is to have a sanctuary like this to present to them, to have something for them to come to and say, this is beautiful. So thank you all for that uh, wonderful gift that we're giving back to not only God, but also to our community to be hopefully amazed by this story. For those that are visiting with us, we want to say hello. Uh, my voice may be a little deeper. I don't know if it is or not, but it feels a lot deeper than it normally is. And uh, it's because my, my kids and I haven't been exchanging the crud with one another uh, for this last weekend. So we've been having that whole sniffle head cold thing. And uh, unfortunately, I think Kelly may be getting it too or getting over it. No, maybe. Okay. We went to the movies last night and uh, we accidentally shared what we didn't accidentally, but we shared a Coke. We didn't really think about it because we were hanging out with the twins trying to watch the Grinch Show Christmas. And, uh, yeah, we didn't last very long. We had to leave. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a good, valiant effort, uh, nonetheless. For those who are visiting with us, uh, we do uh, have a special Abbott series going on. It's called Eye of the Season, as you see up on our screen here. Uh, you may notice an odd thing for Christmas, and that is the hurricane symbol. Uh, and the reason for that is because the theme of this season, uh, we're doing this uh, sermon series, I should say, is, is taking a moment, a moment to not forget in the midst of all the goodness of Christmas and all the things that are going on well in our life and all the blessings of life, to not forget that there are many out there still hurting. And uh, as many of you know, you saw the pictures just this last year, you saw it this year, you saw it years ago, with many different hurricanes that have come through and just wiped out cities, wiped out towns, and how easy it is at this moment to forget about that. I uh, spent some time listening to the news this week through the radio. I drive around a lot, busy people doing things. And, listen a lot to radio, and so I, I listened to the NPR, and I noticed that every NPR story this week, none of them mentioned the hurricanes that I could listen to. Now, maybe they did, and I just was listening at the wrong time, but the hot news topic right now is not the hurricanes, and yet so many people are devastated by these right now. These whole life has been turned upside down. And so we've been asking ourselves, instead of, well, you know, during when the hurricanes hit, there's a lot of relief efforts, but you don't care about them as much anymore, do you? They kind of fell off. And so we've been trying, trying to be a people that don't forget. A people that would say, you know what, we know people are hurting and we're not going to let it just go off their minds and think about that, but we're going to take some time to not just only think about them, but to do some projects to help them as well. So in the past, if you haven't been with us, we actually have been praying every day at 1.30. Hopefully you guys still have your prayer sheets for different items that the people going through hurricanes uh, still go through, and so we've been praying for that during this series. Last week we had the challenge to write a letter to some of our United Methodist churches that were down and affected, whose sanctuary, a lot of their sanctuaries have been just blown to pieces, uh, different communities just destroyed. And so hopefully uh, the challenge is to send three letters to some of the churches that have been dealing with this. So letters of encouragement, saying, hey, we're in this with you, God's got this, and he has prepared you for a moment such as this to be a light in your community. I, uh, I wrote, of course, some letters myself. It was actually a humbling experience. I don't know if you had that experience if you wrote one yourself, but... Uh, it, it was just to write a letter of encouragement it seemed so odd in today's world. And, you know, I shared with them that, hey, our church uh, is with you, and we're going to be doing some different things in the future that, to help you guys out and all this type of stuff. But to write a letter is saying, you got this. And God has prepared you for this moment. And even though it's hard, you're going to be the light to those around you. And so we're praying for your strength in these days ahead. And to think about truly, this church being the hope of that community. And in so many ways, that may be the fact, right? There may be the only hope in that community for many years to come as they do this recovery. 
It was a humbling experience. And so we've been asking each and every week something about Scripture as we go through the book of Matthew, the way it tells the gospel story of Jesus' birth. We've been asking ourselves, what can we do? Uh, and this week's a little special, so just prepare yourself, is all I'm going to say. Uh, as we come today, there has a sermon series name for this, uh, this specific name today. Instead of hurricane, it's called Here He Came. You get the little... Yeah, you got it. Okay. I knew if I just said Here He Came, you'd be like, what? Then, yeah, okay. So Hurricane, Here He Came, is the idea of the sermon series here today. And so for all those that are uh, joining with us online, we want to thank you for being with us. We know you've grown just when I told that little joke just a second ago, and you were with us, and so we heard that all the way through the internet uh, in our station. But as you're here today, the Gospel of Matthew wants to point out a few things, and I want to take some time to look at that before we move on and talk about uh, today's world and how we can maybe react to it. And the first thing was, as we read in the scripture, we read it really last week, if you ever notice, there's a couple names for Jesus that Matthew points out. If you go back to the first beginning of the first chapter, remember the genealogy, it ended with this. It called Jesus this. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, and the husband of Mary, who was born of Jesus, who was called the Christ. So we have one name. Christ means the anointed. So not necessarily a godly title, per se, but the anointed one, the one that's going to be the Messiah, if you will. In today's, or in last week's reading, we actually read about Joseph gets the angel coming to a dream to calm him and to give him an encouragement for these days ahead and to talk him into keeping Mary as his wife and to raising this son that will you know, be a stepson, if you will. And they call him, he says, give him the name Jesus. Now, if you didn't know this, Jesus is the Greek name for Joshua. Now, if you didn't know this, Joshua means something. It means the Lord saves. When I was thinking about this, you have the anointed that Matthew's claimed. You now get the Lord saves. And then you're going to get this next title that he points out in today's passage. Remember what it says. It says, All this took place and fulfilled the Lord had said to the prophet, said through the prophet, that is, the virgin will be with child and will be given birth to a son. And they will call him, you guys may know it by heart, Emmanuel. So we get yet another name for this person, Jesus Christ. And it even goes on to tell us what Emmanuel means, which means God with us. And so when you look at Jesus, already three names have been given to him, right? He's the anointed, the one that's been prophesied, that's going to come and actually lead Israel. He is the Joshua, the Lord saves. The Lord's going to do a mighty work through him. That's only God's work that God can accomplish. And not only that, but his name is God with us. Those are pretty groundbreaking things, right? And the whole point of what Matthew is kind of alluding to here, not only being born by a virgin uh, and the Holy Spirit and all these other good things, is that Jesus, hello, is God. <laughs> right? And so it's kind of easy in our culture maybe to read that and miss it, but in the ancient cultures, they're reading this and they're like, oh, his name is this, his name is this, his name is this. And, and over here over the head, his name is Emmanuel. As in his essence, the name is being like the essence of a person. His essence of who he is means God is with us. And the Lord saves, and that he is the anointed. I laughed at uh, this was the Here He Came sermon, because the sermon is all about this idea, that Jesus is God, and God put on flesh and came to this earth. Now, I know we told you before, right, uh, that's Advent, Advent, and we have the birth of Jesus here today, so we're kind of cheating. We're not supposed to actually get to Jesus' birth a little later, so I apologize. But... Nonetheless, I wanted to focus on this thought here today. Now, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us to do ministry? That Jesus came in human flesh. He was a part human. He wasn't just a piece human. He was 100% human. That God had become 100% God and he became 100% human for us. You know, why is this important? There's many ways to look at this. I wanted to start with a, a debate that I was uh, not part of, but I got to hear. It was at Georgia Tech, and it was back when I was in college. And they had a, a debate between a Christian, what they call an apologetist, which is basically someone who basically goes out there and says, here's why I believe in Jesus, and here's why it makes sense. Um, and they had that verse, and someone who was an Islamist, who was also the same thing, an apologetist. And so they had a debate between the two. And it was really interesting to sit back and to listen about the two dialogue each other. It was, you know, cordial. It wasn't like a, you know, not like a political debate. It was like a real debate where they actually, like, talk to each other and try to respond to each other. And uh, it was really interesting because at one point, 
the Christian was making the point, like, hey, well, Jesus, you know, had to die, and we got forgiven through Jesus Christ being died on the cross. And this officer just looked at him and said, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing, but, but he said, basically, that doesn't make any sense. God, why does anybody have to die? Like, why can't God, who's just ultimately powerful, just say, you're forgiven, done, over it? And it was real kind of interesting in that moment, you know, it was things you believe, you know, growing up in church that you're told you believe, and it's part of your faith. And all of a sudden you go, why? Why? <laughs> right? And me, who was a college student, you know, I didn't really sit there and kind of wrestle with it for a moment there. Why was it important that God became flesh? Why was it important that there was the cross? And why couldn't God, who's ultimately powerful, just go, poof, you're forgiven, done? And it's because the, the, this event in history is one of the critical pieces of our faith. And it's so important, we've got to talk about it quite often. And in fact, we talk about how important the cross is, how important the resurrection is, and that's true. That's the main part of our faith. But almost just as important is this idea that God became flesh. There's a few things about that that are important. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a few things I wanted to point out here today. Why is it important that God became flesh? What does that mean for us? Well, it means a few things. First of all, it means and it proves God has love for us. The Christian stance is that we're in plight. We are in death and sold into slavery to sin. We are in a horrible pickle. And if God puts on flesh, doesn't just make a phone call, right? Doesn't just send a letter, but comes to us in person, it's a whole different thing. When you think about someone who was sick, and dying with a disease that was highly communicable. Something that if you go, there's a good chance you're bringing it back with you, you're going to die yourself. <clears throat> who are the type of people that would go see that person? Would it not be those who love that person to, you know, to the point of they risk death themselves to see that person? And that's exactly how it is with Jesus Christ, that his love is proven because he came flesh, came down to our reality. The second thing is this, is that it proves that he can relate to us. When you look at the stories of Jesus being on earth, there's tears, there's injustice, there's pain, there's hurt, there's sorrow, there's people being beaten down that he encounters, there's people, Roman authorities that hold power with an iron fist, there's betrayal by his friends, there's being abandoned and all these feelings that many of us have gone through. And one of the amazing parts about this, why it's important, is because Jesus right now, is called our high priest. In other words, he's the one that sits there, and we have our issues and our burdens, and we bring them to him. Not only is he God, a powerful one can do something about it, but he's human. And he walked on this earth, and he understands your hurt and your pain. And he can be a high priest for us like no other high priest can, because he understands what we go through. The third thing is this, is that it makes us hear his teaching, right? God can call and talk to the prophets all he wants, but when he shows up in flesh and blood, you better listen. <laughs> and in fact, in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, there's so many teachings of Jesus. He goes on and on and on and talking and talking and explaining what the rules of the kingdom are. What is the theme, the values of the kingdom? How should you live? How should we live? How should we do ministry? How should we do all these different things? We have to take that more seriously because if someone is willing to come into your house and to say, here's why you should vote for me for president, that means a lot more than talking on the TV, doesn't it? Showing up in person means something. It's something we should take from this gospel story. And this is the final thing I want to point out on why this is important. Is it allows us to be redeemed by his perfect sacrifice. You say, well, is that the answer to that debate? And it is. Because the understanding is not that God had to be bought off. The understanding is that each of us were enslaved to sin and death. And that God actually bought us back through Jesus Christ. And by him coming in flesh and blood, he gets to be for us a new Adam, if you will, a new person that comes and lives perfectly. And then when he dies, the sin that was on us is placed on him. And then he conquers death itself. And so the idea that happens is not just that there's the cross and death and resurrection, but God gets to be both merciful and just at the same time. That these two things that seem maybe opposite polar things that are both accurately described by God, that God is both just 
and merciful. You see, sin can get away with it. And all the horrible things that have happened to you, no one gets away with this. But if they're placed upon Jesus Christ, he paid that price and that burden. And that means that mercy and justice meet. And all this is possible because Jesus became 100% flesh and blood. He was the here he came. Now, I've been talking theologically really big. I'm going to give you one more thing. So if you're not only you know, exploring Christianity, I'm going to give you a word here today uh, that you may have not heard before. And that is this. We call this a big word in Christianity. We call it the incarnation. And that means, if you're kind of you know, in a bubble of Christianity, you're kind of exploring it, that means if you go to a Christian party, you now get to walk up and go, oh, they buff you. The incarnation is very cool, isn't it? Whoa. Right? So that's what we do at Christian parties, if you didn't know that. You know. But, uh, <laughs> And of course, they're all laughing here, and if you're with us, showing us online, uh, that's not how it is, right? There are these big words in church that we use that mean these really, really big ideas sometimes, and they sound just kind of out there, but this is something really down here. We call it the incarnation, and it means Jesus was like you, was like me. He went through the same temptations he went through. He went through the same hurts that he went through, and yet he never, ever sinned. And he didn't just sit there and go, look at me. I'm awesome. He said, I'm going to take your sin. And I'm going to take it to the grave with me. And when I rise, you're going to rise with me. It proves God's love toward us once again. But I had an interesting thing happen in the seminary. I was uh, in a class, and they were talking about this idea of incarnation, incarnation, incarnation. If you go to seminary, you use words like this all the time. So just, if you ever go visit, it's kind of a fun thing. You're like, what are you guys talking about? Um, but anyways, they say incarnation, incarnation. And one uh, group was talking about one day, he said, you know what, <clears throat> we did a fun little study one time. We, uh, you know, this is one of the seminary professors, he was talking in his class, he said, you know, we were talking about the incarnation, like, what does it practically mean in your life? And he said, uh, we got together with some professors, and we called up some of the bar, you know, graduates that had you know, been very successful in churches, you know, larger churches, doing some really cool things. And they asked this question, they said, hey, um, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is the incarnation? And everybody said, oh, it's a 10. It's like, you know, huge important, big, huge deal. Then they asked this question. They said, uh, what difference does that make in your church? And he said, it was really like a dream that none of the pastors could really answer that. Everyone was kind of floored by that idea. Like, this wasn't just some ivory tower conceptual thing. That it actually had ramifications for how we do church. And as I thought about that question, there's many answers to it that I would give. But there's two I wanted to kind of focus here today and one that's going to lead us to our action for those who have been hurting through hurricanes. But the first one I want to say is this, and uh, uh, I'm not preaching to the choir, <laughs> no worry. And, and you are here today, so you get to like get that like bill of good health, you know, you get to, like a free pass you know, here today. Um, but I want to challenge us to think this in the future. If the incarnation matters, then being here in church matters. And I know we have our online capabilities, we have our things we send out, all this type of stuff. But honestly, unless, you know, it's obviously if you're a shut-in or someone like that, that's a great way of extending. But if your only way of doing church, if you're watching this online and maybe you haven't been part of church, maybe you're overseas somewhere far off, you know, if you have the opportunity to be part of a flesh and blood church, it matters. You can feel it, and you guys know it too. When this church sanctuary is full of people and you're singing, it matters, doesn't it? Then when everybody's on vacation, and it's sparse. Your participation in Sunday school, or if you're part of that, or whatever ministries you do, if you're there in person, it matters. I have uh, some close friends that live, I shouldn't say I, my family, we have close friends that live in Japan, the Smarts. They may be watching you today. Hi, Smart family, if you are. Uh, and they're uh, living over there. They've lived there for a few years now. And one of the hardest things they found is finding a church. And so for them to go to a church, get this, they get on a train and go to another city, right? not like another stop, another city, and then they get off the train and walk a few miles to get to a church. By the time they get back, the whole day's gone, right? I mean, they've spent the whole entire day. I can tell you right now, talking with them, how much it means to them to be back when they're here in the States to go to church and be among friends and family that love Jesus Christ, they would say to you with utter, utter like, just exuberance, be part of your church. And I understand there's times where we miss Sundays and different things go on, maybe sickness, or maybe we go visit family, and all that is okay. But at the same time, our culture is kind of this idea of, oh, if I have the time. And I want to challenge you not to think that way. I want to challenge you that being flesh and blood matters. 
And so being part of this congregation matters. Attendance matters. Being here matters. Because we can glorify God at a whole new level every time we're here. And so just know that your pastor must encourage you to be in attendance. And if you're watching online and you say, hey, I live in another city. There's no way I can attend you know, the church you go to or the church right here that you listen to. I just want to encourage you. Find brothers and sisters in Christ. Become flesh and blood with them. Because the incarnation matters. And the second thing is this. I know uh, many churches that I've been part of so far, uh, they're really good at raising money, really good at sending money, but it's a whole other thing when they send people. And what I mean by that is when you think about missions and mission work, you know, it's so easy to think about something going on over yonder or something going on over here. Yeah, when you think about Jesus, you look at the worst places in the world that he came from, in flesh, Blood. And not that raising money is bad, not that sending money is bad, not that doing all those things are bad. All those are great. Jesus calls us to do them. But at the same time, there's kind of an element of sense. You know, be there in flesh and blood when you can. When I was a youth pastor, uh, I look back on those years with fondness. So I spent five years doing both an associate pastor and youth pastor kind of duo position. And it was amazing to me. Of all the memories, of all the good things that happened those years, the most important thing that I look back on that says that made the biggest difference in the world and in the lives of the people that I remember was taking some of our youth on mission trips. And I know a lot of people, I've talked in seminary circles where they say, you know, they, they would look down on that. Honestly, you might, that might surprise you. But anyways, there's kind of a talk of is it good or bad. But nonetheless, when I look back on it, I say, no, it was good. You know why? Ultimately, theologically, because the incarnation matters. And when you take kids, I say kids, youth, when you take youth, and you take them somewhere, you take them out of their element, and you make them go be with people that are hurting, with people that don't have much, with people that are, you know, see, they see with their own eyes and have to experience with their own hearts and tummies when they rumble about being hungry and being thirsty. And you see people that don't have much, and you have to help them, and it's hot, and you're just trying to work on their house, and you're sweating to death, and all these different things. And you learn to have compassion for others, to love others. See, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? And the truth is, everything in the church, in some way or some form, needs to have that incarnation to it. I uh, was thinking again about this week about the hurricane victims, and I uh, was also doing a little reading. Uh, many of you know Dr. Jim Burge, who comes to our church. Um, wanted to read you. He has a book. You know, I know that. I learned that very recently, having lunch with them, had a great lunch with them, and he, uh, he gave me his little book. I appreciate that. And so I was reading through it, and it was interesting talking about it. He wrote this back when, uh, uh, a little bit ago, and he was thinking about those hurricane victims, such as Katrina. And he said this about this. He was talking about in his book. It's about a book about grief. And he was talking about, hey, there's a new normal when you grieve, right? When someone close to you passes away, you got to find a new normal. Like, life is, is never the same. You can't go back to what it was. And he was describing the analogy of some people he met from the Hurricane Katrina catastrophe. He says these words, It was not until I talked with a gentleman and his wife, who had literally fled from Louisiana to stay with relatives in Middle Tennessee, that I began to visualize the impact of losing everything. This couple fled with only the clothes on their back, nothing more. Their house was destroyed. Their means of transportation was now a refuge. No pictures, no pets. Everything personal and dear was gone. Never to be retrieved. Nothing tangible to hold in remembrance. It was all spelled in capital letters, G-O-N-E. Gone. What a feeling. This caught me in ways difficult to explain as never before I learned what gone actually meant. And particularly, that one does not begin anew where they left off, one must start all over again with very small pieces. You know, Jesus looked at our life and saw people who need to start over again in very small pieces. As responsible as he can. And the truth is, in some way as a church, when we see people who are starting over with very small pieces, you know what we need to do? Ready? <laughs> you know what's coming? We need to go. Not just money, not just cards, not just prayers. We need to go. 
You're going to have a chance to respond here today. We don't know the details of it. We don't know the hows of it, the whys, the wheres. But at some point this next year, I want to challenge this congregation to send a team to one of these places that would affect America. It doesn't have to be Michael. It doesn't have to be one of the recent ones. It could be, oh my gosh, you got the whole East Coast plus Texas all the way around there to find somewhere to go. But I want to challenge us. Let's send a team to go in flesh and blood and to serve, to be Jesus in those communities that are earth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and here's what I want to do today. We're going to have our final closing song in just a minute. Maybe God's working on your heart through this sermon. Maybe God just the reading of the scripture. However, God's working on your heart today. If you say, Pastor, send me. And actually, it's not Pastor, it's God. <laughs> I'm just a vehicle. I'm just another. It's actually, hey, God, send me. I'll go. And again, we don't know the time, we don't know the details, we don't know all that. All that's to be worked out. But I just want to know here today if there was a team and you were able to go, would you say yes? And if that's you during our final closing song, would you come up to the altar and just stand as we sing? And we could pray over you and pray for these days ahead that we could send a team to go on our behalf and to be the incarnation for those who are ready. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather again today, we thank you so much for your love. And we remember again that you are the God of the here he came. That you didn't stand far off. You, didn't, you weren't aloof. You came down into our homes to show us your love, to give us what we needed, and ultimately to free us to a new life. Lord, as we're here today, our church, we surrender to you and to your will. Use us as you will. Send us where you will. And help us to love whoever you send us to all of our heart, all of our soul, just as Jesus Christ has done for us.